Welcome to How to Beat the Difference with your hosts, Joanna and Paul, a podcast for the career you want, or maybe just that push you need. If you want to know what your dream career looks like, join us to get inspiration from industry experts that will make that dream career a reality. Hello and welcome to How to Be the Difference with your host, Joanna Molina. And Paul Linsky. How are you today, Paul? I am good. It's a terrible day. Um, <laughs> it's grey outside, but besides that, I'm in good spirits. How are you, Joanna? Also in good spirits and happy to, to be in, seeing all these reviews that we are getting. So keep them coming because I love, we love to hear from you. Positive vibes, uh, love it. Yes, 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 yes. And today we have a really interesting topic is about human resources. What do you know about that, Paul? Um, not a lot. I suppose hiring, firing, CVs, that's, that's about it. Yes, I think a lot of people will probably have the same and we have an expert today that is going to tell us all about it in my opinion um human resources are the most important resource you can really have in a company is its people uh but let's go straight into our guest who do we have here with us today Sue Lybird, MBE DL is a multi-award winning businesswoman with 25 years experience in behavioral change human resource management and people development Sue is an author, a TED speaker, a champion of inclusion, a former International Businesswoman of the Year and received the titles of MBE for services to business, charity and voluntary organisations and Deputy Lieutenant of Lincolnshire. These are titles not many people achieve. Sue currently is the founder of Sage Blue, a human capital consultancy and sits on a number of boards including a non-executive director role with the UK National Health Service, the NHS. Sue, how are you? Well, I'm really well. Thank you so much for having me along. Excellent. We're delighted to have you. So I suppose we'll kick it off with, would you be able to tell us some of your backstory, uh, just about yourself and why you chose this career? Well, I'm... um, let me start with the fact that where I am at today, I've got a portfolio career and it's a portfolio career by design. Um, a few years ago, I made that decision. I needed the variety um, and that's just slightly how I'm wired. So um, as you quite rightly pointed out, I've got, uh, I'm an HR uh, change and transformation consultant. So I have my own consultancy. Um, I've got another, I've got a small number of non-exec directorships, one of which is with uh, the NHS. Um, I do a lot of speaking and I do senior executive coaching and mentoring Um, and I'm also studying too so uh, I'm a big passionate uh, a person who's really really passionate about continuing our learning and development so that's my portfolio now but my route to get there um, has been you know moderately traditional I say moderately as in um, you know education route you know obviously graduates diplomas all of that kind of stuff as well as of having um some strategic and senior manager roles that's really interesting sue and i would love to bookmark for for later on something that you said about having your career varied by design but before we dive into that what about telling us a bit more about the hr aspect so what does a career in hr looks like So a career in HR looks broadly like the um, employee cycle or the HR cycle, if you're familiar with that. So what that cycle simply says is that when an individual is coming into an organisation, that uh, there's obviously a recruitment and selection phase. There's an onboarding phase. Then there's the time they're in the organisation and they perform. And there's at some point people have to leave an organisation. So um, that employee cycle um, and the performance aspect is impacted by a range of things. So um, there's learning and development, for example, there's reward and remuneration. So that performance piece has got some little branches that go off that. So a career in HR broadly means that you are 
responsible or influencing uh, the employee's life uh, whilst they're sitting in the organisation. And you can be a generalist and work across the whole of the, the cycle, or you can have areas of specialism whereby you touch on some of those points that I've just made, uh, because they are specialisms within their own right. And that is often dependent on the size of the organisation that you're in. So the bigger corporates, for example, will have a specialist team that looks at reward and remuneration. A smaller organisation, such as an SME, may find that you're looking at performance and you're looking at recruitment and you are looking at uh, reward and remuneration as well as you know um, you know the onboarding of, of, of new staff so it depends really on the size of your organization where possibly specialism lies but broadly speaking it's the employee life cycle or the HR cycle um, that's that's at the heart of anybody that's interested in a, a career that's in HR. And yes, I love that answer also because it ties with some of the myths that we have heard in the past from, from people that maybe HR is all about hiring and firing people. You just said it's not just that. It's also a lot in between from the beginning of the journey to the end of the journey with someone in the organization. Um, so since it's so varied and robust, what do you need to succeed in HR? What are those skills or habits that you need to stand out? Oh gosh, now, you know, pull up a sandbag and get comfortable because I'm going to expand on some of these things. All right, so. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you really need a raft of skills and, um, and these are, allow me to share some of them with you. They're really important. So these are in any order of priority. These are literally as they just bubble up for me. OK, so number one is you've got to be comfortable with conflict um, because you've got to be able to have uh, those difficult conversations. Now, if you are somebody that is not good with conflict or can't have a difficult conversation, you are going to struggle in the, the role of somebody that's working in HR. Um, because we spend our time in that space. We have to either set up those conversations or we have to facilitate those conversations or we've got to help managers have those conversations, you've got to help employees have those conversations. So we've got to be very, very comfortable with uh, difficult conversations and be comfortable with conflict. And conflict gets a lot of bad press, but conflict really is just about being in a state of opposition. That's where you've got two parties that have got a different point of view and we have we operate very much in that space so number one I would say you've got to develop the skill to be able to facilitate effectively a difficult conversation the next thing um, I would argue is that you've got to have an organizational focus um, a lot of people come into HR because they go I like people and that is not enough and those people who are just so people centric um, find themselves on the wrong side of the balance. You've got to have a balance between the needs of the organization as well as the needs of the individual. And um, where, like I say, I've seen over the years, people get burnt out or they struggle or they get disillusioned is because they can't manage that balance. Fundamentally, um, HR is a function of the business and the, the, the goal is to be able to enable the business to thrive um, and to grow and to evolve and to make sure that um, the talent within the organisation um, can fulfil its potential, of course, that has the skills, the knowledge and expertise to be able to do its job. So you're always doing that balance between what are the needs of the organisation as well as what are the needs of the individual. So that's a really key thing. If you cannot keep secrets, do not go into HR. OK, it's, a, it's absolutely it's crucial. You know, you have to be discreet. You get to hear things. People will share things that it's not for you to then go and blab all over the place. So it's really, really important that you have high levels of integrity, discretion, and you can keep confidences because what happens is people test you. And they'll test you with a confidence. And should you leak, your whole reputation is really and truly is damaged. And your career in that organisation will be jeopardised. So, um, and people put you under a lot of pressure. 
Um, but it's really important you hold the line. So confidentiality and the ability to keep secrets is a really core, core competence, in my opinion. So that's a, uh, it's one that often people don't talk about, but this is, you know, the lived experience here. Um, and being, having been very senior as well, I've, you know, loose lips have, um, you know, damaged some people's careers. So you have to have that high levels of integrity and be able to keep secrets and uh, manage discretion. How have you managed that particularly in your career? Because it can get like heavy for you keeping all these people's secrets. How do you manage that to not share them, but also not have them as personal? The secret is, to be honest, is about boundaries. It really is. So it's things like setting the intent, uh, setting up a conversation appropriately. Um, and as and when people start to share um, and if they're, they're starting to look as though they're going to overstep a boundary, you've got to be able again. This is what I mean about that discomfort, um, having the difficult conversation. You've got to stop them. So you've got to remind them. It looks as though the conversation's going in this direction. I need you to be mindful that if you start to say X, Y, and Z, I am going to have to share that with somebody else. So it's things like that. So it's about boundaries, really, really important, and setting up of every conversation. There's no such thing, I'm afraid, uh, when you're in an HR as an informal conversation. You don't do what I mean by just casual conversations, because what happens is if, uh, you know, um, um, uh, you know, an employee finds that they're in some difficulty um, uh, or they've got to raise a grievance, for example, suddenly what happens is they said, well, you know, I did tell HR and HR's going, well, hang on a minute, we were just, you know, having a cup of coffee or I was on my way to get a sandwich. And so you're always on duty when you are in HR. So all those informal, casual conversations um, can turn into something. So it's always important to make sure you have those boundaries. So a couple of other things on my list of um, key skills are, um, as I'm alluding to already, is you've got to be able to be an effective communicator. And when I say effective communicator, you've got to be able to actively listen. Um, and your ability to actively listen is a superpower. And this is something that everybody can practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And that's paying absolute attention, really listening and listening to what's not being said as well as what is being said. So that active listening. So in HR, people should be listening far more than they are speaking. And it's quite funny when I, I'm in the company of um, HR colleagues because we all jabber away, chat, 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 chat. There's lots of noise. And um, because we don't get to talk a lot, <laughs> we get to do lots of listening. <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah, so you can sometimes walk into an HR department and there's a lot of noise and people go oh my goodness me but that's because it's a safe bubble and we can just all be you know terribly noisy um but also the thing about the communication is that there is a lot of writing because we are very evidence-based as a profession um so there's lots of audit trails um, you know, lots of verbatim commenting. So very, very important is the communication written and verbal, but also the non-verbal. So um, we get very, very skilled at reading people um, and using that to help us form and shape some of our questions. So communication um, and, and so I encourage people just to regularly, you know, attend communication skills courses, um, presentation skills courses, um, you know, regularly throughout their career. So even I, who spend a lot of my time presenting and facilitating and chairing, I will make sure most years now um, that I will just go and refresh those skills because you can very, very quickly get into some bad habits. Um, so it's really, really important. So, you know, ability to communicate. Another skill is the ability to give and receive feedback. We spend a lot of time in HR doing that. So obviously, you know, back to our um, HR our employee cycle, you know, recruitment selection, there's a lot of feedback given there, as you can imagine, from candidates that presented themselves who aren't suitable, you have to give them feedback at its simplest level. When we are talking about, um, 
managing performance. So managers, for example, um, empowering them um, to deliver something. And if it hasn't landed well, we have to give those managers some feedback. Um, so all the way through a process, whether someone's being promoted or somebody's being demoted, whether somebody's um, wants to go on a, a particular program and you have to, there's a selection pr process or you're managing somebody out, for example, redundancies or poor performance, um, you are giving feedback all of the time. So that ability to not get in the way, your personal views and opinions to base your feedback based on behavior, based on fact, based on evidence is really important. So your ability to give and receive feedback is, is, is a really, really core cool skill um, that you will see all HR professionals who are good at what they do have that ability, they really do. Um, some practical things, you need to be organized. So I always encourage everybody to do at least a basic project management skills course. You don't have to be a super project manager, but it is lots of systems and process. So if your mind isn't naturally um, organized in that way, learning some basic project management skills is really useful. So it's administrative because of course, like I say, um, there's lots of, particularly in legislation, there's lots of um, steps and procedures and timelines. So if you've got somebody that's got a grievance, for example, in terms of your organization, you've got to follow your procedure. So if something in your procedure says you've got to get back to somebody within five days, you have to get back to them in five days. Six days isn't okay, you're in breach of your procedure and there are consequences for that. So an ability to organize um, is really important. Procedures, scheduling, um, that's HR, that's just like breathing. You know, you breathe in, you breathe out, inhale, exhale. The administrative side is there. So if, if somebody is, you know, hates administration, then they would they'll struggle because it doesn't matter if you've got a piece of software, you still have to input into the software, you know. So um, you've got to be hardwired around uh, or develop the skill to be organized. Um, another skill I would say or competency is around intercultural sensitivity. Now, ordinarily, when we think about intercultural sensitivity, we are talking about the mind naturally runs to you know, race or gender, for example. I'm not talking necessarily just about that. I'm talking about di different departments have different cultures. So the sales and business development side of a business has got a different culture to, let's say, finance. Um, operations has a different culture to procurement so you've got to be able to move around these different cultures within an organization and when they intersect then sometimes there's friction and sometimes there's uh, pushback or the two sides get into conflict so you've got to have that intercultural sensitivity know what the business developers and the sales people are thinking and know how um, back office function is thinking front of house versus back back of house for example so got to be able to understand that but also in terms of the traditional sense of intercultural sensitivity very important too and intergenerational thinking because of course you know we have from graduates right up to, you know, the traditionalists have been in an organization for a long time. And, and so people see the world very, very differently. So one of the things about HR is we're very good at being the translators. Um, so helping these different groups understand each other a little bit better. So I would say intercultural sensitivity is another skill. And let me think, another one may well be ethics. Um, you have to be, I would argue, ethical because we are the, the gatekeepers of an organisational standard. Um, so if an organisation says it's doing this, we've got to be able to uh, hold people to account. So it comes back to some of the points I've made already about some of those difficult conversations. So uh, we are the gatekeepers of the standards. So I, I would say, yeah, difficult conversations. Um, needs of organizations versus individual important that confidentiality ethics standards um effective communicator intercultural sensitivity for me they are the really core 
um, skills and competencies that you need to have in HR, regardless of what your specialism is. Yeah. Thanks for that, too. And I suppose like we were joking at the start just before we we came on here, we were just joking about it's been I suppose we saw each other at the start of this whole pandemic and not a lot has changed since then, but the whole world has changed in a bigger aspect. So how has the role of HR changed with remote working? And I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking about mental health aspects of, of employees. Yeah, well, organizations for decades have talked about how important the human capital is, how important people are in their organizations. Um, and you would expect me to say this, people without an or without people you don't have an organization you just don't people have always been important so our human capital has always been important but what the pandemic has done has really brought that into sharp focus um so at all levels now of an organization we recognize that um how important people are and if we don't look after them we don't invest in them then actually we don't have a business that can thrive or that can grow and one of the key things um, we've seen emerge throughout this pandemic so first of all when we look at leadership is that managers and leaders have had to up skill themselves in terms of how you lead and you influence and how you look after people so they've really had to think about um, you know the talent that sits within an organization and HR has had a really big part to play in HR in its broadest sense now. So, and I'm talking about whether you're, um, how we reward people, uh, I'm talking about how we develop people. So, you know, some organizations have worked very hard at going right, okay, uh, we may have to furlough you, but here's an opportunity for you to upskill. The world is still moving, the world hasn't stopped. So, here's an opportunity for us to upskill you recognizing that for some people so people who are socially isolated for example um, one of the things that HR has really worked on is building uh, opportunities for those virtual um, connections so it's the you know come and have a coffee come and have a check-in um, see how health and well-being so health and well-being very much becoming far more on, on, onto the agenda which I think is very very important HR has also had to recognise that for some people, their domestic circumstances have been a real challenge. Um, and so, for example, we've had increased globally um, you know, domestic violence um, and therefore HR has really been there as a resource and enabling managers and supporting managers in terms of how to um, support staff who are going through a very, very difficult time. And what I'm finding across, and this is globally now, uh, HR is gearing itself up as the pandemic, obviously we're a year in, um, vaccinations are being rolled out um, across the world. We are seeing, um, starting to see a decline in the numbers, not just through vaccination, but just the nature of, of, of the virus and how it starts to extinguish itself as it, we get the variants and then it starts to extinguish itself. So starting to think about how do we create the new normal and how do we prepare people to start to work differently or to return to the office. So HR very much at the moment in the forums that I'm sitting in are starting to think about how do we prepare people for this next change stage. So it's that restoring uh, aspect. One of the key things about HR is you often we're looking in terms of the future. We're not always just focusing on what's right here in front of us right now. So we are a bit, a bit like scenario planners. Yes, and that ties nicely with, with my next topic, which is, which is around diversity and inclusion. So always talking about the future, could you tell us how HR is changing around diversity and inclusion? How is it creating a world that is more diverse and inclusive? Oh, HR, I think, has uh, really got behind this. And um, as, a, as a topic, um, again, it's really come up the agenda these last couple of years. Um, and so in terms of DNI, some of the, the practical things that I'm seeing are um, that getting, first of all, the different tiers of leaders and managers 
to get on the same page around diversity and inclusion. Because quite often what you find is when you sit at board level, so at C-suite, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, quite often in their mind, they are thinking about diversity of thought, diversity of experience. When you get down to the middle tier of leaders and managers, they're thinking about the, what I call the protected characteristics. So they're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, age. So they're very much more in the legis legislative space. And there's a difference. So one of the things that we're seeing right now, first of all, um, in terms of HR, is getting everybody on the same page about what does uh, inclusion mean within the organization. Organisations have been very good at what I call um, diversity in terms of policy and HR now is recognising that inclusion is the bit that's important, equity and inclusion. So what is it that we need to do to level the playing field um, because organisations aren't meritocracies, they're, they're not equal, organisations think they are but they're not because of the human dimension. So HR is very much at the moment in terms of education. Then what it, uh, HR is doing at this moment in time in terms of diversity and inclusion is really tackling, taking a good look and tackling the talent pipeline. So um, if organisations, for example, use recruitment companies, what they're saying to recruitment companies are, what we want to see on our long list are diverse applicants. So diverse in terms of whatever that means for the organization. So again, you know, race, gender, for example, um, and diversity of experience. So they're making sure they're asking now recruiters and they are doing saying to recruiters, look, if you can't bring a diverse um, candidate pool, we're not going to use you. We're going to use another provider. So they're empowering their supply chains to also embark on um, you know, diversity and inclusion. Another thing we're starting to see, and this is from those organisations that are doing DNI very, very well. These are you know, some of the things that I'm sharing with you, is that a panel, they make sure that they are diverse. Um, and when I say diverse, um, we're talking about making sure that they're equitable in terms of power, because there's no point having what you call visual um, diversity i.e you know protected characteristics as we call them where you're ticking a box and going well we've got the black person um you know we've got a disabled person you know we've got a white man so you know that kind of thing so it the optics look good um what we're finding is it regardless of whether the optics look good or not if there's somebody there that is very seen and very powerful they sway the whole of the panel so what organizations are doing is making sure that um, though that panel is um, educated, is um, has done their unconscious bias, knows what they're looking for in terms of the, you know, the hire. So the really HR is really influencing uh, the makeup of panels and the thinking and the behavior of panels. And some of those other organizations are doing some things that I think are really interesting and that is, want before you go to a, um, a candidate and offer them the job is um, what they do is they ask the interview panel to justify their decision to an independent within the organization it's often an HR person or a diversity person so they sit there and go right walk us through the candidates walk us through your scoring um, and tell us why you have chosen this person so they are asking them to see if, if they've got some bias and when people know their, their decision, they're going to be accountable for their decisions, they, they pay a, a you know, different attention to um, how they ask the questions and how they and how they judge. So HR is really influencing now how organizations start um, to fill and maintain their talent um, pipelines. Just those are just a couple of examples of things that are happening right now. That's really exciting. Um, so, in your opinion, and this is like um, more futuristic thinking as well, how do you think are those jobs in the future going to be like, and also the role of HR in, in the future with this accelerated change that we are experiencing? Oh, listen, HR is a really cool place to be right now. I am telling you, because it's evolving, <laughs> it's growing 
absolutely love it. And um, so as I say, you, you have generalists and you have specialists. And so um, we have strategic HR. So I'm very much in the strategic HR end now. So it is about, you look at the organization um, and you look at the organization within the context of the sector that it's in and you are um, shaping the strategy of the organization that the people aspect, for example, the human capital aspect of the organization in terms of that it's, it's you know, organizational context. So far more strategic, where are we going? But we've got a new um, emergent specialism, and that is sustainable HR, because lots of organisations, of course, have got sustainable strategies. So um, climate, environment, social aspects, really important. So to be an employer of choice, um, sustainability is really important. So we've got now the emergence of um, beautiful you know, new area, which is the sustainable HR specialist. So they are looking at all levels of the organization to say, hang on a second, are our policies, are our procedures, are our decisions in line with our sustainability goals and objectives? Um, and if they're not, then what needs to be done and how are we going to do that? So it's not just, you know, what I call waste management and, um, you know, recycling, all of that. It really is the whole aspect of sustainability so that's a new area that is really just starting to come to the fore so I think that's really one to watch and I think it's really really exciting obviously we've got change and transformation specialists um, that sit within um, human capital um, and they will continue to have a key part to play because the pace of change is so quick that um, you need specialists to be able to work with managers to make sure that their, their teams aren't getting behind. So they stay current, stay relevant, stay agile and keep moving. So change and transformation is one that will, will always stay. Of course, as I've said, linked to that is that people have to uh, continue their learning and development. And absolutely essential. So you will, there'll always be a place for the L&D professional within the, the field of HR, without a doubt. And of course, it broaden that to your organizational development. So what's the organization of tomorrow look like? Um, so trends, forecasting. We have obviously data is everything in an organization. And um, so we have obviously HR data analysts. So what's our data about people within our organization, as well as our supply chains, as well as our customers? What's the data around people telling us? How do we mine that? and use that meaningfully to grow not just the workforce, but also the organization. So as you can see and hear, hopefully in my voice, just how exciting a field this is now, it really is interesting. So those people that think it's just about hiring and firing, get over yourself, it isn't. <laughs> yes, you, you definitely <laughs> managed to, to, to give me some of that excitement, like, I now want to change careers <laughs> to <laughs> HR. So I want to pick up lastly, a bookmark from the very beginning, you said something really interesting, you said, I have a varied career by design. And I'm curious to know, how did you design your career? When, when did you actually said HR is for me? And also, I want to have a consultancy company and, and all of that. How do you design your own career? Well, my approach is I don't look, my whole career, I've not looked for jobs per se. I haven't said, oh, there's a job over there. That's what I want to do. That's, that's not how I've been hardwired. What I do is I look for what I call the core ingredients. And then when I've got all of the core ingredients, then I go, so what job out there has got all of these core ingredients? And that's how I, I got, first of all, I suppose, into HR. Um, so, for example, core ingredients for me have always been around change and transformation. That's, that's in my nature. Um, so as long as there's change, things are moving. That's important. So they're key ingredients. Um, variety is important. I'm uh, passionate about lifelong learning. You cannot now today train or 
uh, get your degree and stop there. You have to keep evolving. Otherwise, you're going to go the way of the dinosaur. You will just literally disappear and you will not be relevant. So um, one of my key ingredients are learning and development. I like analysing um, and analysing information um, and drawing conclusions from that. So again, I also like designing things. I like shaping and scoping new things. I'm a bit like a mechanic in that regard. You know, give me some components and can I make something new out of it? Um, also, I love problem solving, creative problem solving. I'm, again, I'm hardwired around that. So some of the things is make sure that um, those ingredients, put them together and you go, where out there is there a role that could fulfill those ingredients? And so HR became a natural space for me to spend a lot of time. It's about people, it's about developing people, it's about change and transformation. I get an opportunity to influence. Um, but also the thing about HR um, that really excited me was that we're about making recommendations. People, it's one of those myths. Everybody thinks that, you know, HR with a judge and the jury, we're not. What we do is, you know, synthesize lots of information. We advise and we guide, whether that's the employee or whether it is um, the management or the leadership, and then they carry it out. So we're an enabling of others. We make recommendations to others. And that is really fabulous for me. Um, so we don't have to do all of the doing, that's not our job, but it's enabling and empowering others. And that's a key ingredient. So I sometimes think that HR found me as opposed to me finding it really. Thanks so much, Sue. I also, during, during the course of this interview, I, I've crossed off a couple of questions around hiring and firing. So we're all good. <laughs> um, just a uh, last, last question. There'll be a lot of people listening now uh, specifically for HR. Is there any kind of resources that, that you would get inspiration from that you could recommend to anybody on the call? I think um, any particular resources. I think it alludes to some of the skills that I was sharing earlier. Um, go and develop those. And there's lots of um, short courses that are out there. Um, and to practice these skills. They are um, they're essential for life, not necessarily just for HR, um, but they are key in terms of HR. So I would encourage people to think about getting a list of what they see are the core skills or go and spend some time with um, somebody that they think is very good at their job in terms of the HR field and dis ask them, distill down what is it that they do and, and, and how do they do it so well and develop those skills for themselves. Um, I would also say I, I'm an avid reader and not just staying, and this for me is really important, not just staying in the field of HR. You do need diversity because the thing about HR is we're mixing with people from all different walks of life, different backgrounds. And it's really, really important that we can be relatable and the advice that we're giving is relatable. So read and study widely is what I would say. And don't just stay in a narrow, you know, compliance led, um, whatever your professional body is and just stay in that same filter bubble. That I think is quite dangerous. Um, so podcasts, journals, short courses, obviously professional qualifications, um, sit in different forums. I think the whole gamut of CPD is really, really important. And um, I'm currently just reading a book. I've got it here, it's sit, sitting on my desk at the moment. I spent some time over the weekend. In fact, I'm reading two books at the same time. I'm reading Brené Brown's Dare to Lead. Excellent, absolutely excellent. I'm two thirds of the way through that one. And the other one I'm reading is Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? And um, of course, there's a little sub line about and how we have to fix it, of course, um, by um, Thomas Shamaro Premusic. And um, really, really interesting read. This isn't a, a, a man bashing at all, but it is how sometimes we make um, mistakes in assuming that confidence equals competence and that's they're two very very different things 
So I would advocate in terms of resources, do some reading and listen to some great podcasts. And Brenna Brown is an amazing author. I also love her and all her ideas around vulnerability. So I'm with you on that one, Sue. She's brilliant, isn't she? She is. And it's, again, you know, my bias, it's research-based, it's evidence-based, but she's got an ability because she's a really good storyteller not to make all of that research and evidence feel heavy. She just makes it so relatable. Easy read, easy listen. Absolutely. Sue Lybird, thank you so much for today. It was absolutely brilliant. My pleasure. Thank you. And that was our chat with Sue Lybird. Absolutely brilliant woman. Um, what did you make of it, Joanna? Yes, no, really insightful. And um, did you notice her passion? Yeah, I, 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 I want the job in HR now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, that yes that was fascinating so that's it for today you can reach us at how to be the difference at theintengroup.com or on social media at the intent group and And until next time before you say goodbye to everyone please (laughs) don't forget to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts it really helps um the growth and everybody listening some more people can listen thanks a million joanna thanks a million for listening everyone thank you Bye bye bye